Welcome to Interconnections, um, the closing event for the Interconnect Initiative, which was and still is actually a collaborative inquiry into digital transformation. Um, for those of who, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Barbora, and I am the national director at IMA. Today, I am talking to you from where IMA is physically located in Chachake, also known as Montreal. It is the unceded territory of waters and lands of which the Kenyan Kihaga Nation has been the custodian since time immemorial. I am a first generation settler here. My, my own ancestral land is what today are delineated as the countries of Lithuania and Poland. And I have lived on Turtle Island for over 20 years. With the ongoing occupation of Ukraine, and as the genocide of Palestinians in Gaza continues, issuing the land acknowledgement seems like an extremely small gesture of awareness. And yet, it brings forward the commitments and solidarity that we need to hold into action. It brings awareness to the settler colonial systems of oppression that continue day in, day out, to shape the places in which we live, we create, we work, and we celebrate. It moves us towards change. Folks present today are connecting from throughout Turtle Island, and I invite you to take a moment and share with us in the chat the places from which you are joining us. We're also sharing a link to Native Land, a website, a work in progress and growth, which presents a map of Indigenous territories, treaties and languages. You can find the link in the chat now. It's lovely to see everyone connecting. Um, so obviously Interconnect would not be possible without the contributions of many partners. Um, I just like to name um, folks on our oversight committee today. Um, thank you to Alexis, April, Clayton, David, Jennifer, and Luann for working with us on the oversight committee. Um, their tremendous organizations are on the slide that you see in front of you. And of course, we need to thank the Canada Council for the Arts for funding this project. To host the rest of the event, I'm gonna pass it back over to Benjamin Allard, who is the project manager of Interconnect and who has really spearheaded this work over the last two years, and he will take it from here. Thanks, Benjamin. Thank you, Barbara. So my name is Benjamin J. Allard. I'm a project manager for IMA, and I use pronouns he and him. So Interconnect was an ambitious initiative, which realization took over two years. I It would not have been possible without our project partners, of course, but also without the support of our precious team. So Samuel Pascalin for Interconnect and Barbara, Marilyn, and Yuko for IMA. Thank you very much. Before I introduce you to our panelists today, I'd like to briefly present Interconnect. So Interconnect came from the desire to make the knowledge generated by recent digital innovation projects more accessible. We decided to focus our energy on creating six co-learning groups. In total, it was 42 artists and cultural workers with the help of a team of facilitators who explored how the art sector used and was transformed by digital te technology. So we're fortunate today to have with us many Interconnect participants. So I invite everyone who has been involved with the project to write a little something in the chat or to wave at your camera. It has been a real pleasure to uh, do this initiative with you. So hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. Over the course of the summer and the fall of 2023, they shared their experiences and learned from each other by exploring three discussion areas. These three discussion areas, created in partnership with our advising researcher, Margaret Lamb, were named with evocative titles, all about access to culture, a digital future for us, by us, and navigating uncertain times. Ultimately, the discussion areas were meant to be open to interpretation because we wanted the participants to guide the workshops and decide collectively which directions to explore and what outcomes to produce. 
Some of their insights and notes can now be consulted on Praxis, a platform for discovering and sharing knowledge for a more collaborative and open society. But I'll say more about Praxis at the conclusion of this event, because today we decided to invite you to join us in a collective reflection around Interconnect's discussion area. So we are privileged today uh, to have with us six, six participants from the Interconnect initiative, one for each co-learning group. Our main prompt will be, how can we foster a more interconnected digital transformation in the arts sector? The structure of the event is relatively simple. We'll explore in sequence the three discussion areas with the, um, with the panelists, and then welcome questions from the audience at the very end of our event. For each discussion area, we have prepared a small survey to be able to tap into our collective wisdom. Your answers will inform our conversation. But let me first present you quickly our six panelists. For the, for the discussion area one, all about access to culture, we're, Jane, we're joined from St. John's in Newfoundland by Amanda Penny. Amanda is a mother, visual artist, and the operation manager in, uh, at the Artist Run Center Eastern Edge. Hi, Amanda. Welcome. The second panelist based in Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton is Christina Battle. Christina is an artist who graduated with a PhD from the University of Western Ontario. Her research and practice focuses on the concept of disaster and community responses to crises. Hi, Christina. For the discussion two, a digital future for us by us, we'll have the, cha the chance to talk with Andrew Singh, joining us from Vancouver. Hi, Andrew. Andrew is a composer, midi multidisciplinary media artist and musician who also works in the art sector as a technology consultant and cultural worker. Andrew will be in conversation with Heather Steinigan, Steinigan joining us from uh, White Arts Yukon. While Heather, you are the Director of Operations and Digital, Digital Strategist for the Canadian Craft Federation. In addition to working with the Federation, you're also an artist and a fine toy maker. So welcome. And finally, for the discussion area three, Navigating Uncertain Times, joining us today from Australia is Stephanie Peterson. Stephanie is an academic researcher and lecturer with the University of New Brunswick. Uh, you worked all over the globe to help people and guide them so the messes and problems of our world don't appear so scary. So welcome, Stephanie. And finally, we are welcoming today Daniel Hyde, a multidisciplinary Indigenous artist, placemaker, and educator uh, working in Toronto. Their practice centers generosity and ethical relationality. Um, through the creation process, uh, aiming at building a decolonized, inclusive community with art. Hi, Daniel. I'm glad you're here. So we'll start today with the um, with the discussion area all about access to culture. So this is a discussion area that recognizes that art and culture is always done in community and is shaped by a variety of factor. The first question we have today is for you, our audience, who can use the chat in Zoom. <laughs> so it is very open-ended. In, in a few words in the chat, share one thing that you have learned from working with the digital that can help in creating a more interconnected community. So this can be one word, a sentence. Uh, we are asking you to share something that you've learned or you discovered. And what we mean by access to culture is quite large, so feel free to interpret this how you'd like. Also, working with the digital really means being in contact with digital technology, digital transformation. So I'd like to, uh, yeah, to hear from you. And we already have someone says increased accessibility, definitely. So I'll let you populate the chat and we'll return to that periodically. Um, and I'll slowly turn to our panelists. I'd like us to, to start uh, Christina and Amanda, uh, so you're our two panelists for this first section. I'd like to start to talk about digital transformation from something that is not so tech driven, but to look at it rather from a social perspective from the perspective of culture and community. Uh, Christina, 
In preparation to this event, we talk about how the pandemic of COVID-19 brought one or two years of very accessible media online. But the main focus was to bring art to audiences and not so much to build a community per se. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about the subtle nuance. In your opinion, why is it important to distinguish us simply accessing something online and, and being part of a community and creating a community? Maybe we'll start with that. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, and I'm also looking forward to the section on uncertainty, because I feel like we might learn some things to answer this very question. Um, yeah, I think when we were talking earlier and thinking about this um, differentiation between access and then community building and what that might look like or what that might mean, um, I really like thinking about um, access to artistic works in this context as sort of a prompt, as like a first step, as a thing that maybe helps you find and think about um, even how it is that you're defining community or what community means. I think we often throw that word around in the arts a lot um, without necessarily understanding of how one another are defining it. Um, and I think access to artistic exhibitions, programming, um, everything like that online, really allows that sort of spark of entry to sort of figure out who it is that wants to be in dialogue with one another. And then maybe how that then further leads to collaboration and connection as well. Um, I think it's that sort of beginning step that um, I know for myself, um, one of the things I really value about having access to the arts through digital means. So, you know, essentially I'm talking about the internet here. Um, is an opportunity to really um, move beyond the local community, right? And thinking about um, finding others who maybe have similar interests, shared concerns, um, and even shared questions about how it is that we're approaching and thinking about artistic practice. Um, but it really is like, that's the first step. And then it really takes that time to think about how um, community building might even begin to take shape. Yeah, I love how yeah seeing that as a first step, but as a yeah as a prompt, as an invitation. And so I'd like to turn to Amanda. We also talked about the pandemic and how it encouraged us to maybe better take care of each other. And at Eastern Edge, you spend a lot of time thinking about how to welcome artists and audiences, and both in your space but also virtually, with care being at the center of what you do. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on the importance of care in the digital transformation, especially in artist run center. And maybe, maybe you're doing that second step, right? Of inviting and, and, and building something. Thank you. Um, can you hear me all okay? Yes, we can hear Loud you. And clear? Wonderful. Just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah. Um, so at Eastern edge here, um, when, like during the pandemic, obviously we had to close our doors, but we were setting up the exhibitions anyway, and we were bringing in a 3D camera to take in the exhibition and then sharing that online. Um, that enabled, when we uploaded the 3D video, uh, we used a technology or a program called Matterport, which allowed you to navigate the exhibition at your own pace. You could you could kind of step in and look at a piece and move throughout the room at your own pace as opposed to um, like a video or film where it was it would just be scanning without any control. Um, when when you're closing your doors and you can't have the audience um, come come in to see the show, uh, this was this was a really excellent alternative because. It, it actually um, expanded our audiences. So since we began doing this, uh, we've, we were able to reach like um, the northern parts of Canada, overseas, some of our artists and residents that have visited in the past were able to just like jump onto our website and see what we're exhibiting today. So that's really exciting, um, a really exciting step in accessibility for and exposure for our artists that exhibit here. Um, Another another step that, uh, or another kind of tool that we used post pandemic, uh, um, like Benjamin said, we, we really try to focus uh, our energies around care. So 
we decided to start making access menus and documents uh, to send to our artists that were visiting um, to let them know about our space, what they were coming in, when they come, what are our schedules? What are our, what does the building look like? What are the temperatures? What are the sounds? When are we open? Who's available? What tools we have? And we, and it also, um, had a doc, like a, a menu that you could select things that you needed or wanted to make you comfortable coming into a new space. So I think technology uh, kind of has opened up the lines of communication um, in a big way um, between artists and places that exhibit art. Um, and we're able to get ahead of it and not put some, so much onus on the artist, but take some initiative ourselves to to help people feel welcome and comfortable in our space. Yes. I find post-pandemic -pand people are nervous and kind of anxious, and we want to approach everything with more care and love. Yeah. yeah, and I see what you're doing with your access document and the 3D scan of your ca gallery. Um, that It does that, right? It's an invitation. People are, you know, welcomed in and they can also look at the at, at your online space. And I think, Christina, you work similarly, right? Uh, digital technology has an opportunity to uh, offer ways to join community, be part of community, almost kind of a, an occasion, right, to uh, to do something around that. I'm thinking about your project, um, about the mesh network in, uh, in Vancouver. Uh, this mesh begins as a stolon, I believe. This mesh begins as a stolon, exactly, where you created a community mesh network with the center 221A, which is a way for a community to own and run a Wi-Fi network, right? So uh, I think there's, do you see maybe connections with what Amanda was just talking about? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I love, Amanda, that you brought up thinking about care and um comfort because I think um, so much of that, as you alluded to, is very much what people in general are sort of wanting and needing, truly needing these days. Um, but also I think that's such an important element of thinking about community building and finding community. Like it really does take time. It's not something that can just sort of happen in an instant. Um, it's something that really takes a lot of care and um, one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about in our discussion area too, is this sort of sense of approaching, thinking about community in really careful ways, right? Like not making assumptions. I'm seeing in the chat, people are talking about um, meeting people where they're at with regards to technology, but then also regards to what they need in terms of um, care, comfort and, and community as well. Um, and so the Mesh Network project that you're speaking about, um, you know, I like to think about it as a really invisible project on the one hand, because essentially it's an invisible network, it's internet, right? It's Wi-Fi access, um, you can't really see it. Um, but the work that went into building that network and that's still ongoing about building that is really a part of community building. So all of that work and time and care that um, helps develop something and set something up um, that isn't necessarily visible or you can't see, um, and with a project like that, I think one of the things about it too is it really hasn't begun, even though there's been over a year of work of developing it and building the infrastructure to have this access to free Wi-Fi in the garden that's at Semi Public in Vancouver. Um, but really now the project begins once community members um, are introduced to it, once it's able to sort of respond to the community and what they need and how they want to work with it in the future. And then maybe there's this potential for it to grow further from there. Um, and all of that really does take a lot of time and care. I feel a bit similarly with Interconnect, right? We had <laughs> um, all the workshops and now we are seeing everyone here uh, having discussion in the chat. Thank you so much for everyone who reply and I think there is a lot uh, that is related to what we just said right but yeah it takes a lot of time and that brings me maybe to the question of resilience right so having a community taking care of each other allows us to be a bit more uh, resilient um, yeah I'd like maybe to hear you Amanda uh, about working in in Newfoundland in, in St. John's with your uh, community. So how do you, how maybe the local and the more extended community, how do you navigate maybe this tension 
as well. So I'm bringing a lot How of a lot of conversation, a lot of ideas, right? So <laughs> that's all right. So yeah, I'm uh, about about time. So maybe you know, I'm thinking about yeah. So there's the local and the global, or how internet allows us to reach beyond our local community, but also what Christina was just talking about, right? How these projects take time, and and sometimes th we think we they begin, but really it's only going to be in three months that we're going to really see some of the result or we're going to be able to to start working really with with the meat of it i see you have to remind me of the question i apologize benjamin so let's focus on the timing you know like christina okay. talk how do how do those projects maybe um, evolve with time how, what is your experience of timing of doing those kind of community and careful project? Well, I mean, building these documents and building the, and like creating that open line of communication between artists and the center. And um, like it, the language is, the language is always evolving and we're learning every single day from all the different people that pass through um, how to care for different types of people. And I just feel like, like, yeah, as long as you're tuned in to care and you're tuned into trying to make this place a comfortable place to be vulnerable and make artwork, um, time, you only get better with time. Like time just informs the practice. It informs the the documents and increases the ability to be able to communicate. Um, the tools that techno like I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Um, are you asking me if it's going to take more time, or is do you think that are you asking me if we need more time to develop uh, and cater to um the people we serve or i'm sure i'm, I'm so sorry i i don't, don't i don't understand the <laughs> don't don't worry don't worry i'm just discussing yeah i i think that's interesting how perhaps when you create an, an access document like the one you you um you created it really yeah. cannot evolve without feedback and without communication right so time is definitely exactly. a crucial aspect uh, of absolutely, that absolutely you're right yeah <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Maybe this would be an interesting moment to bring it uh, to bring in some comments and perspective from other um, participants. So we'll do that at the end of each discussion area after we've talked with the two panelists. We um, would let any anyone else from our panel uh, to to comment. So I don't know if anyone has a uh, strong opinion or something to add in 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 the conversation. Otherwise, I have a lot of prompts for you. Uh, oh, Barbara, <laughs> join us. Yeah, thanks, Majam. I, I think, Amanda, as you were repeating like to Benjamin the various questions he could be asking, I became interested in all like in in how all those questions are interrelated. Um, as in, like, yes, like how does it evolve over time? How does, and maybe this is what Benjamin was meaning. Like, how does time, uh, you know, you are an artist in center, you have timelines, you have deliverables, you have all kinds of time restrictions. Um, and also then you you have capacity, you have capacity limitations in terms of time. Um, yeah, I guess my personal question is, is how does it feel to be kind of pulled in all those directions um, as you're doing this work? And what does it what does it take of you? Maybe I'm sorry. I don't know that that's the clearer question than Mishamai necessarily. Um, it just gives me so much to think about. Thank you, Barbara. I that that's exactly it. We've had to in order to deliver our programs with more care and and to create these documents, we've had to pull back and um, cut back on our program like 
the rate at which we're delivering the programs. We have to slow, I think the this this phase of our um, services, like and the way things have been post pandemic, um, it has forced us to slow down and really tune in to uh, the communication and caring for our artists. And in that way, we have slowed down and we're not de delivering the volume of programming, but we're kind of slowing down and taking care um, um, each step of the way and being more mindful each step of the way and, and with all the different um, accessibility um, limitations and tools to increase accessibility. So, yeah. Uh, to answer your question, I think we've slowed down in the way of we're not trying to rush through um, mass amounts of programming. We're trying to like kind of slow down and make our um, programming or deliver the programming with more quality and care. Like Thank that's you. the that that's a shift that have, that has happened. Yeah. Thank you. I see, and Andrew, you also have your hand up. Yeah, um, Amanda and Barbara, like really. Um, echoing how important that is to have that that time in that space. I think one thing that's really um, shifted in my brain was in the past, I really felt like, I kind of felt like we became like a technology factory. Like, and it was really frustrating because I'm like, why are we just like pumping out tech? And we're, you know, we're supposed to be in the art sector. We're supposed to be working with community. The project I worked on that felt this the most was culturebrew.art, which is a digital platform for BIPOC artists. Um, it's a national platform. And actually my co-director for the project is here, Valerie Singh Turner, who um, probably has so much to say about this, but we really had to push hard to ask for more time. We had to go back to funders. We had to go back to the community. We even had the community saying like, why is it taking you so long? And we had all this guilt and all these feelings and all this pressure. And it was weird because we're like, we don't want to just become the tech factory. And um, so then, you know, over time, we eventually learned to take that space, but it was still in this area of us feeling like we needed to take that space for time. And the thing that shifted for me over the past, I would say even in the past six months, the way I'm framing it is that now it's not like I need more time or it's going to take me longer. It's actually like, it's not about like, um, yeah, it's not like it's, it's we're moving slower. I used to say that a lot, like we need to move slower. And now I've shifted. I'm like, we're not actually moving slower. We're actually moving more intentionally and more thoughtful. So I think we need to get away from this language of like fast and slow, which is like this very capitalistic sort of thing, because if you're not fast, then you're slow. But we're actually not fast or slow. We're intentional and more thoughtful. Um, and so I think that that was a big shift and it made um, Valerie and I, I think, feel a lot better. I don't want to speak too much for her, but I felt a lot better. And I felt like I noticed she felt better as we continued to work on the project. And we made that room for ourselves. With with um, more intent. Well, yeah, because like if you want to really reach your communities, then your things are going to come up like you're like, oh, I'm going to consult with like this group of like, you know, um, like I'm going to speak for for myself, like South Asian artists. I'm like, oh, that's going to be an easy thing. And then 10 learnings happen. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, shit. I'm oh, sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but I'm like, oh, crap. Uh, I didn't realize there's like 20 things that came in, you know, like this is a monolith. That's not really it. So you need to make that you need to make room for that intentionality to show up and those learnings to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is Danielle as well with uh, with your hand up. Yeah, I just want to echo so many beautiful sentiments. I love this idea of reorientating pace. And we always talk about sort of peace, like understanding peace and, and different way of looking at progress as, you know, peace like and pace set to the pace of nature and community and community needs. And I really like this idea of getting back to having things be like this connective tissue around like our collective liberation or community needs and almost like breathing that that life and that complexity back into it. Because I feel like getting, like you said, like getting so caught up in data, getting so caught up in like information, I feel like um, so much of it is it flattens everything. It's either like a simulation or it's just information, but we're not really talking about knowledge. We're not really talking about narratives. 
and how we're actually getting to the roots of the the things that we need to be discussing and engaging and, and creating in our communities through art with art and I really like this idea of just again getting back to that that organic and that creating it really as this wonderful connective tissue bringing everyone together but also just for your own like wellness and, and ability to replenish yourself and yourself and take care of yourself. I think that's, I think that's a really, really beautiful way of sort of like pushing that approach. And I absolutely agree with you, but shifting the language 100% and I'll end my thought there. Thank you very much. I'd like to perhaps return to Christina and David, I do see your hand, but you know, I'll invite you to put your question in the chat. Uh, it, it, we, we, I'm sure there are many of you would like to, um, to comment and speak, but uh, we'll stay with our six panelists uh, for the, uh, the main part of the event. I'd like to maybe return to Christina in the, with your um, with your project with the mesh network you really used the um, metaphor of a stolon right there was a question in the chat like how do you communicate the ethos of care to your participant well i see if we look at plant right it's not so much someone communicating something to participants but maybe embodying a more distributed network right where participant can talk to each other and the community can really appropriate the project is is that is there a shift here that we also need to to think through yeah definitely i really appreciate this question i think um it gets me thinking about two things the first is something that amanda brought up earlier about tuning in um, because I really think of a project like this, but also this sense of wanting to think about um, how it is that we shift this pace that everyone's been talking about um, as really a part of response and being responsive. And within response for me um, is really thinking about reflection. So thinking about what it is that others are maybe responding to whatever prompt as an artist or as an organization you've set out, and then really adapting and pivoting and learning from that. Um, maybe that is a part of the intentional working that Angie's talking about as well. Um, and I think that that sense of adaptation, of sort of tuning in, being able to adapt and pivot um, really sits at the heart of the Stolen Mesh project. So, you know, what we thought it was in the first moment is quite different from what it ended up being. Like for the better, it ended up really shifting um, and moving at its own time scale, involving so many more people and so many more conversations. Um, now in hindsight, that always seems to have made sense. But you know, when you begin something, it's really hard to know. Um, but being able to sort of respond and take up that response is something that I think is really a part of a lot of this. Um, and then the uh, sort of metaphor, although I think about it a bit more than a metaphor, but um, of thinking to plants and stolons um, and distributed networks especially is something that I think really fits in a line with the sense of response, right? I think the sense of distributed networks as being able to sort of have a series of nodes, communities, groups, whatever it is, or however it is you're thinking about those nodes, um, able to figure it out for themselves, to shape the conversations that they want, and then being connected and learning from one another um, really also sets up this sort of, um, you know, maybe network, maybe, um, I don't really, I'm not crazy about the word network. So maybe connecting, form of connecting that um, system, yeah. system that allows us to sort of learn from one another and that sort of give and take from one another. Um, so it means that there's not really a central voice necessarily. The thing itself is um, the system um, or the distributed groups and individuals that are part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll use that as a segue to our second conversation. So, you know, it's a two hour event. Things will go very fast. Uh, our second conversation, our second discussion area is a future for us and by us. And we'll talk a bit more about creating platforms and creating uh, projects, right? Because this discussion area looks specifically at how the arts sector is taking agency over its own digital future. So digital transformation can provide opportunity in terms of governance, sustainability, or public engagement. So the, the co-learning groups invited individuals and organizations engage in developing or using tools, platforms, and imagining a digital infrastructure for the art sector. So we'll start this conversation again with a question for our audience on Zoom. 
It will now take the form of a little survey. It will give us a better idea of your experience with digital initiatives in the art sector. And by digital initiatives, we really mean anything like a platform, a service, or other kind of projects developed by the art sector. And here's the Here's the survey. So we drew inspiration from the drinking game Never Have I Ever. So we have a few statement, a few statements. Please select the ones that corresponds to your experience. And I'll leave that up for a low moment. So we ask who amongst you developed a digital initiative? If you developed an initiative, did you found one at some point that, you know, were doing the same thing as you did? <laughs> did you already use the digital initiative developed by an organization in the art sector? Did you not understood at some point why there was this digital initiative coming up? Um, did you have a, a digital initiative that you love become obsolete or abandoned or discontinued? And if you never used a digital initiative in uh, developed by someone or an organization, the art sector, let us know. So I'll let a few more minutes and maybe we can keep the survey up when uh, we start the conversation just to let the time for most of us to uh, answer it. And right now I can see that we have a lot of people we have you know, I see 20, at least 24 person, 25 person who developed an initiative in the art sector who are with us and that number keeps going up. So that's great. Um, and from them, there is only 10 person, so 23% who found a digital initiative that did the same thing as the one they developed. We have 30 out of 45 respondents who use a digital initiative developed by an organization uh, from the art sector. And 10 out of 45 uh, felt confusion about this digital, about the digital initiative. We have 20 respondents on 45 who had a digital initiative they love, become obsolete, discontinued, or abandoned. And we have only four out of 45 participants who never used a digital initiative. So thanks very much. We'll close the, uh, we'll close the survey. And I can share the result here. I think you can see it. Um, so let's move on to our conversation with Andrew and Heather. Thanks for joining us. In your own way, you both contribute to a more interconnected art sector. And I'd like our conversation to talk about a crucial component of interconnection, which is your experience working with others. So Andrew, hi, I'd like to start with you. In addition to being an artist, uh, you have so many, uh, you do so many uh, different things. You're also, as you mentioned, the co-director and technical lead of culturebrew.art, a national searchable database of indigenous racialized performing literary, visual, and media arts professional. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience building this platform in relationship with other services offered in the sector? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, that could be a novel. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to read you the novel that would be involved with building culture brew dot art. Um, but the experience was that like, right at the beginning, it was super exciting. Like when, um, when Valerie Singh Turner, the founder and, um, the person who, um, conceived of the project was hiring, um, I, I was hired on as a project manager and I was just really excited about the project because, um, I really just wanted to see an answer to this question, um, the question that I kept on facing was, you know, when I'd see programming, people would say, oh, we couldn't have any, um, you know, anyone from any other ethnicity on this show or on this event or in this exhibition because we couldn't find them. And meanwhile, I'm like, we're right here. Like, we're all right here. And so I really believed in the project from the beginning and I was really excited. And so Valerie and I got to work and we're like, okay, let's, let's develop this thing. And it's going to be super fun and super cool. And within like the first four months, we're like, holy smokes, like this is a massive uh, undertaking. There's so many different questions. Um, and so the, the main experience and the main takeaway I would have is actually, we kind of talked about it was time, um, was slowing down and making sure that we were building what we really wanted and that we were honoring the needs of the project. Um, 
And um, the other experience that I really walked away with from it was also expectation of ourselves. You know, we really wanted to build out like the vision for the project was this big, like we're going to build this feature and this feature and this feature. And then we realized we have to start small and um, starting small and specific and achievable in scope um, actually was how we had to shift. And it actually led to much more successful results. So you can like do things piece by piece which um, we also realized like even just from a Marcom perspective, if having something to communicate on a regular basis, hey, we added a new feature, hey, we added a new feature, makes a better marketing strategy anyway. So building this huge thing that's just complete, um, again, for me, felt a little bit like a replication of this like capitalist uh, demand on us to like produce something and it's perfect and it's done and it's packaged and it's clean. Um, so that was like a big experience from it. Um, you mentioned you, you have a question about like how we worked with partners or other um, yes. other folks. And I think so there was a way we were working with people earlier, but there's a newer learning that we're um, we're always learning, by the way. So you're going to hear that a lot from me. Um, but uh, there's a newer learning we have in the past year or so, which really has made me shift um, in how we're working with culturebrew.art, which is in the past, I always felt like I had to like convince other people about why this thing we built that was ours was good um, or needed or valuable. And now I'm realizing, actually, we built this for you. Like we built this for the sector. We built this for the community. Why am I trying to sell it to you? It's actually the community's responsibility. It's the sector's responsibility to really help us build this. So my thinking has shifted a little bit in how we're partnering. I'm shifting towards like, you're not a partner and you're doing me a favor. It's like, we built this thing and now it's your responsibility to make sure this thing survives and to make sure we populate this database with BIPOC artists across disciplines, across the country. So if you're from a remote region, it's your job to help us fill it so that you can go and find artists to curate and to book. Um, that yeah. is probably the mm -hmm. biggest shift in how we work with partners. Thank you so much. I'd like to um, turn to uh, Ether. Uh, so Ether, you are, in addition, doing so many things, as I mentioned, right, you work with the Canadian, Canadian Craft Federation. Uh, I'd like to hear maybe, uh, do you relate with some of uh, the things uh, Andrew said, notably with perhaps Citizens of Craft, which is a website, but it's also sort of a philosophy <laughs> that the Canadian Craft Federation developed? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to establish those key relationships and connections um, continuously and, and to nurture that connection. Um, with Citizens of Craft, I think at the moment it exists more or less as a philosophy because as we understand, technology changes so fast and we're finding uh, we have a lot of uh, digital upkeep to, to have with that website. Um, and as a result, we've actually morphed into a, another project, um, which is a, a learning management system within the sector. So uh, a bit more focused on um, the administrative side of craft councils and organizations in order to support um, those larger public facing initiatives. And I think, uh, Angie, you're saying it's really important just to keep people in the loop with what we're doing and not have this perfect uh, uh, digital tool that exists, but um, having that nurturing connection to continue to sustain uh, this movement and what it is we are trying to achieve and what it is we are achieving with that. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, you both talked about learning and in our conversation, Ether, before the when we were planning this event, you described the digital transformation as the fourth technical revolution, which I think is pretty accurate. It's a, it's a it's an interesting, it's an impressive way of looking at it, and it needs for us to develop a new literacy and new skills. So I'd like to hear your thoughts, perhaps, on on what those skills would be. Uh, and you, Ether, what kind of, yeah, what, what are the skills you, you feel you had to develop in, in creating your platforms and your tools? Um, should I go first, Heather, or would you like to kick it off? Uh, go for it, Andrew. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it actually wanted to touch on something that, um, that Heather just kind of 
um, inspired in me here was that um, the skill that I think is super interesting about um, tech is actually all of my skills as an artist. Like to me, tech and art are very similar in how they are developed if we take away all the tech bro and industry crap. But um, if we stick to like the the really deep work of tech, we're we're really doing it's it's like an art form. It's iterative, it's creative, it's um and Heather, some of the things you were saying, well, I mean, when you said like, oh, we decided to build another platform, I was like, whoa. So, so you, you decided to do more, um, which is amazing, but it was like really that, that tension of being like, we're going to learn from this. We're going to create, we're going to develop, we're going to bring in all those skills that we have as artists into this tech work. And so I actually think that a lot of the learning and the skills that I have came from my artistic practice. And I think also this concept of completion, um, uh, my my artistic practice is in experimental art forms. And as an experimental artist, I've always wondered about complete projects because they seem really um, the antithesis of like what I do as an artist because I'm supposed to stay in process. And so when I looked at platforms, I was like, well, if technology is always shifting and changing, as Heather mentioned, and we're always like chasing after it, like, do we have to keep chasing after it or to, to find the end? Or can we just stay in this process-based state where we're like this is where we're at now and we're going to learn and we're going to develop to me this is very much an experimental art practice um that's adapted so um you know just keep doing art and then tech makes sense <laughs> i'd like to hear from you either uh yeah i would very much agree and i with the, the idea that uh the tech has aligned very much with my artistic practice um, as well, I'm I'm very interested in uh, making things efficient, effective, and intuitive. And I um, have been very curious about where our money goes and and to who. Um, yeah, artists and arts organizations have generally limited budgets and um, very fast paced working conditions. And I think uh, with 2020 COVID life that <clears throat> brought on a lot of tech in a very quick um, way, which is, I, I think, very rushed and that we had to learn the skills very quickly. And in that process, I could really see that division um, of tools and communities, right? We're working with people who have worked with uh, email uh, throughout their career, even uh, mailing letters, and we're moving into more like chat-based platforms. And so we have different pockets all over the place. So I'm really thinking about how do we uh, make things more intuitive, more sustainable, um, and consider the uh, ethics of the tools that we use. Yes, yes. And I see uh, David in the in the chat also, uh, I'd say echo uh, some of that saying that it, it's right time to, um, to uh, dismantle the colonial attitudes that we uh, inherited. So now we have the time maybe to open up to the rest of our panelists to uh, Amanda, Christina, Danielle and Stephanie, if you'd like to uh, jump in, I don't know if someone has a burning something to say burning thought. Other, otherwise, I I like to um, maybe uh, ask Stephanie uh, about about system and complexity. This is something we'll touch on the next uh, discussion area. But there is definitely something there, right? Like how do we uh, develop skills in the ever changing um, landscape, right? Where technology is changing and we need to adapt. I think I, I can pick up from some of the, the language and conversation that's just come with time and process and really, I guess, you stick in there that when we imagine the idea of how art and tech and the relationship there isn't so much about needing to, to unlearn and relearn as we have in other approaches like the scientific method or other ways that have come from a, a very particular way of knowing and understanding that 
we're just really within the past you know, few decades recognizing how limited those perspectives are to not account for the kind of interconnectedness and complexities that uh, emerge as a result. And time, as we've mentioned already several times, is one of the key factors of that, that it's something that is a construct, but it's something that we can't manipulate quite in the way, as you might imagine, as we did in the laboratory, as we were trying to understand things, that putting things under a microscope to be able to understand them uh, is not a reflection of the kind of process that lets the complex things and their interconnectedness actually be more readily understood. So all to say, as we look at what does this shape of the world as we shift it into ones and zeros, the idea of being able to apply that as a process in a similar way to the artistic method, rather than um, one that is more of the, the scientific or a, a colonized kind of method is or brings us more aligned with the kinds of ways to understand the interconnectedness of the world. And uh, the skills that we need to develop in that respect are about not reaching for certainty in places where it really has no business, given that it will not allow for us to have a, the kind of understanding that we're actually reaching for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if another person from our panel would like to uh, jump in, go ahead. Otherwise, I always have a question for someone. And... Maybe I'd like to ask Amanda because, you know, in preparation to this event, you know, you we were talking about exactly that, right? So, you know, I think you said that uh, technology is always changing, plat new platforms are always being developed, uh, some are becoming obsolete. How do we keep up with this and how the art sector generally could keep up with this? What do you think of this approach of seeing it more kind of an artistry, right? Uh, seeing it more as an artistic process. It, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful, fresh way to look at it. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, me, a um, middle-aged woman with a family and a, a full-time job and an art practice, I'm like, I find it really, I, like I have a huge struggle to keep up with the, what are the most effective and safe tools too. We haven't spoke about safety uh, yet about technology um, and like uh, using platforms like Discord or, um, you know, all of them, social media and like, I don't know, I, I really, really appreciate comparing it to developing an art practice and uh, I'm just going to keep listening. I just wanted to um, say that I, I do too struggle with keeping up, but also um, I'm thrilled to be surrounded by all of you brilliant people. I'm going to listen carefully. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have someone else who would like to um, add something? Christina, I'd like to uh, maybe uh, go back with you for a moment because, yeah, this this question of um, of developing skills, um, I'm thinking again about the mesh network because that's something that we, we discussed, but you were literally, you know, put, ruler inside community, you know, people's homes. So I guess there is also uh, a question of like this kind of uh, skill acquisition uh, that comes into place. Um, and yeah, and, and, and as an artist, uh, I'd like to hear how you respond to all of that. Yeah, sure. I, um, I also just want to say I'm, I'm so incredibly taken by this conversation that I, I feel a little overwhelmed because I have like a million things. Um, that I kind of want to say, and I'm, I've been trying to form them into a question and I, and I can't, but um, I think there is something just so amazing and interesting to think about. Um, uh, some of the things that have been brought up about um, changing perspectives within the sector as to like who things are for or who should be doing what. Um, I think Angie, you were talking about that um, with relationship to the project you were working on and how that like, shifting of perspectives is something that takes time iteration came up repetition practice process um and i think that there's something you know quite obviously difficult about doing that within a larger artistic sector you know people have brought up deadlines and having to sort of explain to funders actually we need to do this or we need to do this again um, and I think we've sort of traditionally not been encouraged necessarily as a sector or even internally as ourselves um, to think about the way that we engage with community and the way that we engage with projects 
artistically as something that could be repeated or done again or tried again or in um, incorporating conversations with the same people more than once, right? We've always had this sort of sense of, okay, we need to always work with new people, which, you know, obviously there are reasons why that is also really good and important. Um, but I think that there's something really amazing and exciting and inspiring about this conversation itself as a way to kind of remind ourselves too, like, oh, you know, maybe we do need to just keep practicing this and keep trying um, and not necessarily feel like we're, we need to have all the answers or develop something new. Um, I think that again, comes back to something that Amanda brought up earlier of like tuning in and really like being responsive to what it is that we need and those that we're working with need as well. Um, and maybe it's something that, you know, is clearly coming from the individual, like everyone who's here is invested in thinking through these things and reframing the way that we think about working on artistic projects. But maybe it's something that also needs to sort of come from the top down in a way as well, right? Of like thinking about how this shift of perspective that we're all speaking about um, might be infectious, might sort of shift the way that the culture of the artistic sector nationally operates. Um, and I'm really excited to see that people are thinking about this. I think there's something really nice about this spark um, that Ima has brought together of like, okay, we're all concerned with these things. And like, now what do we do, I guess? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, and I think, you know, in the interest of time, we have one discussion area left to explore, but I think this might be a nice way to, uh, to take a little break. We'll start back. Thank you. We are now arriving at our last discussion area navigating uncertain times. This topic recognizes that digital technology can bring rapid change. So we invited people to reflect on how to strategically plan in times of uncertainty. The co-learning groups looked at past initiatives, discussed different topics that can help us chart a course for the future and imagined how we can use digital transformation to foster a more equitable, diverse and inclusive art sector. This brings me to our final question for our audience on Zoom. So please briefly in the chat, um, share one thing we should remember to infuse hope into the future of digital transformation in the art sector. So I'll give you a moment uh, to reflect and to answer. The question should be posted in the chat very soon. Uh, so please share one thing we should remember to infuse hope into the future of digital transformation in the arts sector. And we already have a few answers. So Jacqueline saying there are so many opportunities for collaboration. David says, explore what accessibility really means. Valerie, that we bring our humanity to our work. And I invite you to continue to uh, publish things in the chat. We definitely look at it and we might re re respond to it and be inspired by it. Now I'd like to move to our next two panelists, our last two panelists, Daniel Hyde and Stephanie Peterson. Hello to both of you. Thanks for being with us today. I'd like our conversation to talk about the opportunities, but also the threats and the challenges that digital transformation raises for the kind of relations we are building as a sector. Daniel, I'd like to start with you. You have many hats. And in addition to being an artist, you're also the chair of Tangled Art and Disability Gallery, where you think a lot about fostering interconnections and stewardship. We talked about the role of accountability and reciprocity in relationship building, but often in our digital world, relations are treated as commodities and our data as resources. How do you think the digital transformation could perhaps give the art sector an occasion to act with more reciprocity and accountability? How do you create a space for this in the initiatives you are part of? Mm, really wonderful. Thank you for that, Benjamin. Um, and just thank you for so many uh, wonderful sentiments. Uh, I, I feel like many words uh, that have been echoed and that have been said already will come up. Um, so when I hear your question, I think of, of just bringing it back to how stories are, are really an anchor for care that creates space for accountability, that creates space for reciprocity. And really, like, 
by connecting to how we situate ourselves in, in our work, in our community, in our practices, in our families, um, just how this really grounds these relationships, these, these reciprocal relationships, the, this idea of reciprocal care and the ways that, you know, we can really build trust and uh, show up in the relationships that, you know, we cherish. And so I think of like this purpose of reciprocity as, as really being grounded in this gift logic. And I hear a lot about, uh, you know, needing this shift uh, from the transactional to the relational. And I'm thinking about how that relates to care and having our relationships grounded in care and accountability and that reciprocity um, and how that helps us, how that provides us with the strength and, and what we need to sort of navigate what we call in certain times. But uh, I really don't think uncertainty is is the you know the problem here. I think you know it's really about how we're grounding these sensibilities and how we approach that uncertainty. I think uncertainty can be a really beautiful gift of change. Uh, I know there are certain certainties we feel sometimes about uh, almost a mutually uh, you know assured destruction you know for our climate, and that's not really helpful or, or fosters uh, you know a good you know us feeling good in any way. So I, I like there's opportunity in uncertainty and it's sort of in the roots of our stories and um, you know, how we want to plant the seeds to sort of unpack those. And I think that, um, you know, in shifting, um, you know, that the ways that care can really facilitate the convening, the cultivating, um, the conceiving of the, the phenomenon that we call our stories that we get to share and listen to and engage and what that process of, of listening actually looks like. And again, you know, making sure that that is grounded in that, that relationality, um, you know, laying, like, I think that knowledge is a living part of us and it becomes a kind of story in our telling. And so it can't be de decontextualized. It can't be separated from us. Uh, Self-locating and our positionality in our stories is, is really, really important. And I think that that leaves the foundation for accountability because it's hard to be accountable to one another when we're building those relationships. If we're not pos positioning ourselves in, in the stories that we're telling, or when we're actually receiving those stories and listening in, again, in that gift logic. And so both stories and ourselves are, are born of these connections to a very relational world. Um, and then these also, they weave, they're not just about our present, they weave our past and futures as well. So it's these, these epistemological and ontological, these ways of being and ways of knowing in the world. And I think that, you know, when we know our stories, that's that's a root in us and it can't be removed. And when we tell our stories in the telling, we know our home because we can imagine and we can feel it through that not that knowledge. And I feel like that that embodiment, because the imagination is that that embodied experience is it's something that sort of speaks to everyone and the ways that we all kind of have a cause or a way to relate to each other in in sort of how we want to build these relationships and acknowledging that and, and recognizing that position I think is is really important and so mm -hmm. I see story as sort of like a method in an anchor root and imagination is sort of like this energy is in both like a metaphor and a cellular level to sort of you know regenerate ourselves and and approach how we are uh listening and receiving stories in in a good way mm -hmm. um so i think when we're convening knowledge through this very active uh you know kind of storytelling it's not enough to tell different stories and not enough to tell certain stories through a certain framework but we really need to be listening differently to those stories and so when i think of uncertainty I think we invite a lot of fragility in hyper-focusing on the roots of our problems at the expense of feeding the roots of our solutions. And these went really, really deep in so many communities. And these are stories and connections that are time immemorial. They are reaching, reaching deep. And, um, and, and in these long-term relationships, it's to not fundamentally honor that in communal care is is to risk that trust that we need to sort of engage in that reciprocity to have that accountability so we don't 
we we not only build a sort of structural rigidity into how we approach things, into our art practices, into the arts organizations or policies that we build, but we also kind of give up control over the conversation to those dominant cultures, those colonial logics, those things that are that we are identifying as being very problematic to ourselves, our wellness, our community, our environments. And so I think of sort of it as a as a solar system. And when I think of how I want to approach um, navigating, you know, developing these spaces, this capacity, these relationships, I always like to ensure that I'm not centering things on colonization. It's it's not the sun of everything because that's not what I want everything that I do and everything that I'm building towards to be orbiting around. It's, it's definitely in the solar system. It's there in the orbit. Um, I identify, you know, ableism, other, other forms of oppression are in that solar system, but they are not the center of, of, of that universe, of that, that future of change that I'm looking to develop. And so, you know, I feel like when we don't build space for care, for celebration, for laughter, you know, without sort of like these inner workings of a circulatory system of this kind of capacity that we need, um, then we lack the resilience to sustain and flourish. And mm. we can't replenish ourselves, our neighbors, or our relations in a good way. So I think to really unsettle that is to to go back to that gift logic, to this approach of how we are telling and receiving stories. Um, to be in community is sort of is then becomes this resilience. It's this opportunity for z- resilience. So that uncertainty is not something that needs to be so devastating. It is something that we have this this capacity that we're constantly replenishing together um, to to address and and treat as sort of like an opportunity, a strength, or or a gift in and of itself. Um, that- and I always like this. Oh. Mm-hmm. No? Well, I was I was about to uh, to to go back to with Stephanie actually because i think yeah. there's a lot of things that you uh, you mentioned that r- relates a lot with uh, some of the things we wanted uh to talk also with Stephanie, were, were you done do you have something else no, uh, no, a, a no, final no, thought please. no i'm good to roll the conversation let's go <laughs> yeah because stephanie we also wanted to talk about frameworks and complexity right and how we should focus on process rather than content so i'd like to maybe hear hear your thoughts also about let's say accountability and relationships and 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 the role of arts organization perhaps in developing those shared narrative yes i think the idea of complexity is in inherent if with the idea of uncertainty um, that it is by nature of the complexity and interconnectedness of our global societies and the networks and relationships within them that makes it so that our reach for certainty is what makes it so that we without necessarily intending to reinforce the very systems that we may be trying to call attention to and that by not being so comfortable to dwell in that discomfort, to, to, to remain in the space of, of something that is about not simply pointing to problems, but neither just leaping to solutions, that allowing for that space of uncertainty, that vulnerability uh, to be based on that foundation of relationship rather than on the transactional is the work that requires for us to actually have those senses of the trust, the hope, the reciprocity that all come together in the kind of interconnectedness that makes it so that who we are as as individuals and as community are able to actually come together to find those ways to navigate through what isn't actually about the degree of uncertainty to certainty, but is about being able to recognize that what we're navigating through is is that that space together so that we can actually you know, recognize the more comprehensive whole. Mm-hmm. That's the, the process, that's the, that's the work. Um, and we have a tendency to want to reach for, for, for solutions uh, in the urgency and pace at which that we're presented with problems and wanting to find some way to navigate through but it's the it's not dwelling in that uncertainty that uh, that finds us in that space of, of repeating and and reinventing and recreating the same very systems that we're actually intending to to dismantle mm-hmm. and, and i found it very interesting danielle when you were talking about grounding ourselves right and and finding our stories and uh, not necessarily dwelling exactly on that uncertainty but uh, i feel that you know we do hear a narrative about 
the importance of being grounded, but that's often I see something that we lose with the digital or that we tend to forget perhaps. Yeah, no, a absolutely. I think that uh, I think the big risk of the of the digital is sort of like stories losing this binding force. And I think that, you know, only by sort of like drawing on multiple points of ourselves and really stirring and getting into sort of like our memories and where we're coming from and our telling, do we, you know, really reclaim sort of that uncertainty and reclaim how we're weaving the past and the present and the future. And there really is this difference between reclaiming knowledge and, you know, information and, simul and, and simulations of things, which I think is, is so much uh, within the digital spaces right now. We're not, you know, and I, I agree that while tech has sort of like changed in terms of what it can do, I actually, um, in terms of what tech is about, for me, because so much of it is so very capitalist and is so very grounded in, in still those colonial logics and narratives, what it's doing is actually quite old to me. Um, and I don't see it like 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 that that what it's searching to do is being sort of um innovative. Like there's there's something to me about the idea that you can't standardize a human being, but you can absolutely standardize the tech that they use. And how that can be a means to sort of like flatten, flatten emotions, like flatten um, our, our, our stories and our imagination, which is this really incredible, powerful tool that we have to, you know, forecast ourselves and envision these new futures. Um, you know, it, it, it's worth sort of like, you know, pr protecting that and, and really, you know, ensuring that, you know, we're working within those, those narratives to not fall into sort of like flattening ourselves or reducing the, the ourselves um, in this process of, of doing this this collective work you know I just think that it's you know I, I think that there are certain interests invested interests that you know would rather see certain systems and certain powers stay in place and that I think that if we are generally going to try uh, you know challenge those and sort of unwind and unpack these ideas of of colonialism and time um we know it needs to, it needs to come from community and it needs to come from those those narratives um that we are that we're building together to right again it's that collective tissue around sort of um reclaiming our our stories and that that collective liberation mm -hmm. and i think that would be an, an interesting way to open to our the rest of our panel, uh, Christina Hammond uh, and you and Heather, if if uh, we'd like to listen from you and if you'd like to reclaim your your place within this uh, panel, if there is there anyone who'd like to um to jump in. Uh, yeah, I just really mm -hmm. loved what you had to say, Danielle, and I, I wrote in the chat like technology moves fast. It's really important um, to have that self awareness within yourself. Uh, whether you're, you're an artist or working within an organization um, to stay rooted in your values um, and your mission and your mandate and have that reflecting what it is um, you're trying to achieve so that um, like the technology can change and you could uh, move to different platforms, but uh, your overall um, root system is really what's kind of holding you steady. Mm hmm and maybe you know feel free to join anytime but i'd like to um i have a question for you stephanie we're, we're staying within the the panel but uh, i know that you you work a lot on developing frameworks and systems and you accompany groups uh towards the reflection i'm curious to see um you know developing perhaps meta system right how can two systems or two stories can talk with each other so um, about like a large coalition building if you have any thoughts on on that because i feel that navigating in uncertain times also ask us to act collectively i think a really interesting uh, way to connect all these things is how we've actually been doing this in the describing and explaining and that's often through metaphor so reaching for ways to describe and explain uh, that allow for us to have the the understanding so our frameworks and our processes are reflected in ways that aren't uh, aren't relying on a single way of being and knowing but are reaching for different ways of articulating that and nature has been doing this for millions of years so we don't have to necessarily be quite so concerned about 
coming up with these new frameworks and ideas um, and that the millions of years by which that nature has done that and that for thousands of years that we as humans have been articulating the way to understand that through story and being able to to have the recall where that's a part of our DNA and reaching for that as the tool of the way to be able to describe and explain and allow for some of the ways that we understand the world to to move in the pace at which that uh, that knowledge is has been shared and to let that tension with the the pace of digital actually just sit as a part of that that shift and change and how might we uh, reinterpret uh, rather than just try and reach for things that will allow for us to keep up with a pace of a certain kind of way of being that will inherently uh, shift to whatever system allows for things to be maintained at the kind of equilibrium that the mm -hmm. system's designed to do without there being, I guess, such an expectation of it being quite so nefarious. Uh, I know that these things are often come from well-intentioned spaces where we're just trying to deliver on solutions. We're just trying to, to help fix and, uh, that as as a part of that narrative of the kind of, of overarching notion that we approach the world is, is sometimes what gets us into those binds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like maybe to ask Andrew, because we, we come back to something that we talked, right? Changing the rhythm with which we, we work and maybe having more intention with the the, the things uh, that that we work so Andrew you were I think you were sh sharing in the chat that um, cultural brew dot art was perhaps more a, an artistic project or um, something like that so uh, maybe I'd like to hear your thoughts on building those kind of shared narrative is this something that you also have been creating uh, with your different projects yeah I think that for me it kind of happened I did an interview with this experimental artist this Iranian um, queer artist who he had like a t-shirt shop and I was like well what's up with the t-shirt shop he's like it's an experimental art project like why do you have to <laughs> he's like, why are you trying to turn this into some boring business he's like I'm being an artist I'm doing my thing and I was like oh my thing is an art project too then because it's infusing my artistic work into it and um yeah and I think that that pace that like iterate the iteration I mean iteration has to be in tech in fact it's in all of the tech uh, methodology like agile development is literally iteration and that's an artistic process so to me that pace of iteration has to happen um and you know we're talking about navigating uncertain times and like where we're going to go next and i would say right away the first place i'm going to go is i'm never going to work with a developer who doesn't know how to work that way again that is for sure, because it was really hard to work with rigid developers who would go, oh, the needs are changing, the requirements are changing, the specs are changing in a frustrated way. And I'm like, but this is what the work is. Like, why are you surprised? <laughs> and so um, I think that, you know, as we, the, the, the navigating the uncertain is something that in the arts sector is part of our responsibility. It's our responsibility to go into, you know, into areas that we're uncomfortable to ask questions and to take those risks. Someone made a really great point about how we need funding that um, allows us to fail, that gives us space to experiment. And um, that is true for technology as well. Yet a lot of the digital funds, you know, they ask questions about how are you going to ensure this is successful? And I'm like, how does this both fit? Like, why do you want me to ensure it's successful and you want me to innovate? Like the word innovation and guaranteed success seem in conflict for me. Um, so someone should tell them to not put that question in there anymore. But um, yeah, so I think for me, it's like really making that, if we're gonna see this as artistic process and artistic practice, I loved what someone said earlier about how maybe this is the practice of this is trying again. And just like our artistic practices, you do the painting over and over. I'm not a painter, so I don't know if they do that, but in music we do. We do things over and over. <laughs> there, are, there are a couple of painters who do things over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're just about to open up the floor for the question period, but before we do so, I'd like to um, see if any other panelists have any other thoughts, final thoughts, concluding remarks uh, rapidly in a couple of minutes before we uh, open it to, uh, to the question period.
Well, I'm sure that we'll have many very interesting uh, questions. So thank you, everyone. Oh, here we go. So thank you to all our panelists for this amazing conversation. Um, we do probably have a lot of questions. Uh, Barbora, um, I'll give you the mic in a moment so you can walk us through some of the things that have been said in the chat. But before, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, you need headphones and a microphone to speak. So, And this is for the safety of our interpreters. Also, speak at the conversational speed pace for our interpreter. Uh, before speaking, please raise your virtual hand or write in the chat and I'll invite you to speak. And if you could start also by uh, saying your name, it would be uh, very appreciated. And please try to keep your questions and your answers quite brief as we only have 20 minutes for this uh, moment. So Barbara, um, what kind of questions or considerations do we have in the chat? We have a few things in the chat, but um, can I permit myself to make a meandering statement that's sort of a question that will frustrate everybody? Go ahead. Um, there's something really that I've been trying to frame a question around how you wonderful panelists think about um, about the climate and the environment and the intersection between um, tech and yeah, and climate change, but also the environment more generally. And I think the way that, as you were all speaking, this came to me was really thinking of technology and, and the platforms we produce, the, the Wi-Fi networks in a material way. And this probably betrays the my curatorial background of like caring for objects and caring for people and caring. Um, and that kind of framing it in that way um, really you know, also comes back to this, like doing more, doing more, producing more. Um, and is, is, isn't is that just like, yeah, just making more stuff really. Um, and yeah, I don't have many more like coherent thoughts about this, but I was wondering, yeah, how this, th this question weaves through your work. Um, and if you, yeah, if you had, if you had more cohesive things to say about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bob. I can jump. Yeah, I can jump in on that. Uh, I I definitely challenge productivism a lot in my practice. And I think part of it, one, an overarching thing um, that I'd like to see is a shift uh, and broadening of the scope of what an artist can be. I think through colonial logics, we've sort of been isolated to this idea of being either a producer or a consumer. And I would like to see that expanded to being creators and engagers. Because I think that, you know, you can engage with a beautiful flower without plucking it and taking it home. You can leave it right where it is and it's in its home and its community. Um, so I think that that I think part of that gets to the roots in terms of like how we are allowed to expand in it, our, our roles and, and take on that space. And I think it's also come up about, about pace as well. Our the pace we are that we have progress set to is, I think, unsustainable and out of touch. And I think tech kind of like follows along with that because it's the newest and it's the shiniest. And, you know, that's that that's what we're, where we're at right now. And um, that definitely has uh, limitations that I don't think it, the industry itself even recognizes. And I think that's the great role of artists here, um, as you've heard, is just sort of like to challenge that, to forecast different features and to bring the ideas that, it, that the artwork inspires to do work in the present on um, my thought there. Thank you very much, Anil. Christina, you also have your uh, hand raise. Yeah, I really appreciate this coming up because um, this is something that I think a lot about as well and was quite concerned about when, you know, especially at the start of the pandemic, which is still going on, um, really started to see this increase in this desire for more digital platforms and technologies and things within the arts. Um, and this conversation around climate change and the impacts of that environmentally seemed very, very lost or non-existent in a lot of ways. Um, I love that the conversation began of this thinking through about doing more and more and how that is a problem, you know, even thinking about environmental footprint or carbon footprint. Um, but I did just want to also say that there, there is a lot of information out there about how we might um, begin to think about 
um, incorporating strategies for thinking about carbon footprint into the digital work that we're doing. Um, and maybe I can add some links and things as we go. Um, but I think what I sort of worry is that that conversation is often really lost. So I think, you know, beginning with um, having access to that information is really critical, but then also demanding that we sort of take that up as we're developing these tools, as we're thinking about um, how it is that we're going to be having conversations. You know, one of the nice things that's easy to point to in the conversation we're having right now, you know, it's on Zoom, so clearly that does have a carbon footprint, but very much less so than if we had all traveled to one place together to meet and have the conversation. So maybe we can feel a little bit good about that. Um, but, you know, thinking about ways and strategies of um, incorporating all of that into the work we're doing, working with green servers, working with maybe even solar powered servers, um, thinking about um, how it is that the images that we put up on a website have like a large um, carbon footprint in themselves and maybe how we can like lower the compression of things. I think all of that is is things that we should be having at the forefront of all of this work that we're doing. So I really appreciate Barbara that you brought it up. Thank you very much, Christina. And we already have comments in the chat saying that those links would be interesting uh, to, uh, to share. Uh, Barbara, do we have other questions uh, that came up in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like we had, sorry, just give me one second to track my notes down. Um, I think Sean Jordan um, had so many lovely questions in the chat. Um, one of the ones that maybe I'll start by asking is, is a difficult question. I think it's, do you have the wisdom or how to, do you have the wisdom to get to kind of handle the conflict and turbulence inherent in all the processes of creation that you're involved in um, differently? Yeah, how do we account for conflict? Mm -hmm. Do we have someone who would like to um, to go? I, I wrote a, a note in the chat. Uh, and from my experience, like the conflict generally arises from misunderstanding of what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, so in the group or in community, can you find a shared goal that you can agree on? So what is it that we're trying to achieve, whether it's an effective way to communicate daily tasks or whether you want to share uh, knowledge with the public? Um, so just identifying what goal would be helpful uh, to, to pursue. And then from that, are there already processes already in place that could be adapted um, as a scheduled on, uh, onboarding increment? So um, change is hard and get, I feel like it gets harder as we um, get wiser. So um, taking the care to understand what people need and what would be the most thoughtful way to onboard it. Um, there's so many times where we have done projects or I have done projects and it's great and wonderful. However, the process of bringing people in was rapid. So um, the it wasn't a shared love. So just making sure that people are really into it, uh, into what you're doing and, and finding those shared goals and also um, be willing to compromise and adapt is also very important uh, because things change. And um, like I said, change is hard. So just supporting each other in that process. Thank you very much. I saw Stephanie opening uh, your mic and Andrew has uh, your hand raised. So maybe we can go with Stephanie have you, if you have something to add and then we can go to uh, Andrew. Thank you. The idea of, uh, of, of change being so uh, uncomfortable, um, I think that we, we find ourselves uh, in this desire for wanting to have to change and shift to, to the existing issues that we see and uh, absolutely the idea of wanting to be able to find that shared and common ground uh, before before the before the work begins in the sense of it being that the work itself is about establishing that shared common purpose so that when things not if things actually reach that kind of level of of, of conflict that we have that to to be able to root ourselves in to ground ourselves in 
the idea of wanting to give that space for disruptions and and questions and defining things and asking more and more questions before we even attempt any kind of answer is important as well. But then to have that space where our cohesion and our community and our relationships are when we do make that shift to say, right, dwelling in the uncertainty in perpetuity is neither possible simply for the, the need to have action, the need for moving forward, even if that does mean that it will result in needing to return back and have further iterations. But there does need to be a, a point in time when we do actually decide to, to go forth. And it's, it's with those disruptions and with that space where everyone can come to develop that shared goal together that then let us move forward in that. So it's, it is, it's the process itself is more reflected about that relationship than it is about any given aspect of it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Andrew? Um, yeah, I think that um, I love the points that um, both Heather and Stephanie have made. Um, um, I think also there's another perspective on conflict that um, I, that's important to me, which is that, conflict is also exciting. Um, like you don't really watch a movie to not watch some kind of conflict and not to say our life should be like a movie, but um, there's something really interesting that happens with conflict. It's growth. There's opportunity for learning. The growing pains that we have, they come from conflict. Um, and that conflict is an opportunity to have, you know, someone's pushing back on you. Someone's pushing back on your belief and it's going to create conflict because if you really love and believe what you're doing, that's going to be hard to, to digest at first. And so I think that, um, you know, when in the work that I've been doing with artist communities, even like within my own very own community of South Asian artists, there's conflict in that definition. Like I, I was in a session the other week where it was like, people were like, I don't like the monolith of South Asian. And some artists were like, I really like this. And then, you know, some conflict happened. And that's super important to develop and understand complexity. So to me, conflict is a part of understanding the various um, aspects of who we are as humans, the complexities and nuances that we carry. And so I think that um, aiming to avoid conflict or to prevent conflict is actually potential for a missed opportunity because what could happen is that in the goal of making sure that we are um, you know, reducing conflict, we are perhaps not bringing in voices that are difficult to hear. We're not putting ourselves into situations where um, we might hear some really hard things. Um, so I think we just have to uh, learn to stop being afraid of it and to, to not be so afraid of hearing things that are that we disagree with. We can disagree and still be friends. I disagree with a lot of my friends, so it's, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think there's something really um, beautiful about, yeah, like mitigating harm that happens through conflict, which is really what I'm hearing and what you're saying, Heather, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm really hearing like harm mitigation and ensuring that there's like respect and space versus avoiding the conflict specifically. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just add to that just uh, as well, just, uh, you know, love is a guy, kind of guiding principle in that. Um, and so like the way that that listening differently, uh, you know, kind of opens up hearing the other person's perspective. And uh, there, there's always great space for nonviolent communication um, and the way that, you know, that we're listening to, to the other side. And I love you know, we call it from a peace states perspective, we call it transcendental go goals. Mm. So it's anytime you're setting a goal above and beyond what the original set intentions or goal or goals were um, and coming together. But yeah, just really critical love and also just uh, not necessarily getting it all right the first time and maybe coming back to the table a few times and working it through. And because if, if it's you're in it for the long game, then, you know, that's about that gets to building those relationships. So, you know, if you're resolving a conflict, you are, you're obviously invested in, in working with and, and supporting the, a cause or a community. And so that's, you know, that takes time in and of itself. Thank you very much. Do we have final thoughts on this particular topic? Then I suggest we go to our next question, maybe our final question, maybe we have the time for one or two questions. Uh, Barbara, what, what, is, uh, what is next in the list? 
Yeah, so there's kind of more a practical question in the chat right now um, around how do you kind of as artists, um, as arts workers, um, how intimately do you work with the technology via coding, monitoring, et cetera, that you engage and how much do you purchase from a vendor or a host and kind of outsource that? And how do you balance those two things? I love this uh, very practical question. Thank you. Who would like to um, who would like to start? I don't mind. Um, I do find our team works remote, so we're all across Canada, and we are using tools that already exist. Uh, in the past, um, the Canadian Crafts Federation has worked with developers to build um, websites from the ground up. And we're finding with such a fast paced technology, five years really feels like 10 uh, in terms of uh, upkeep. Um, so I think it's really important if you are working with a developer, just to set those expectations ahead of time. So you're not um, scrambling in five years and really coming to the conclusion that you have to rebuild again. And like the, developing from the ground up is not um, inexpensive. It's actually quite expensive. So we're finding using tools that already exist um, is practical, both in cost and necessity, but also aware that so many of these companies have existed way longer than a lot of new startups so if i also understand the expectations that we have so if you want to build uh, a community-based uh, website you're not necessarily going to get facebook they have so many experts so many people on staff um and ceos galore so just understanding um what it is, again, going back to the values, what it is that you really need and what it is you're really trying to establish. Um, and there are many companies who are understanding that people are needing uh, ethical tools, which means uh, environmental sustainability. So uh, we had mentioned uh, the impact of data and um, our planet. So I really thinking about that and also understanding that a lot of the words that we're using, like ethical considerations, um, accessibility and environmental impact are also marketing ploys. So it can take a lot of time just to really dig in there and understand what these companies are really trying to achieve. But I am noticing there's such an influx of Canadian and local companies and local developers really getting out there. So I love interconnection for that. Um, like, how can we connect and find these people? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Heather. Yes. And, and it's uh, working with uh, service providers or uh, organization or ways of establishing relationship, right? We've discussed a little bit in the, in the conversation. Andrew, you also have your hand up. Yeah, um, I really like this question a lot. Um, and I think that the biggest thing that um, I can share is that I actually, um, well, first of all, I think that there's life cycles for technology and there's stages. Like there's a time when you oh, using a vendor is appropriate. There's time when there's times when it's appropriate to do things yourself. So I actually trained in software development and learned as much as I could um, about coding and like getting my hands on the tools was an important part of me developing this, um, the technologies that I work with on various projects. And so um, I actually had a lot of oversight into the tech and the building, and I really deepened my knowledge there. But then there is a point when like, you're like, I can't do this forever because I didn't actually sign up to be a coder or a software developer, and that's not my passion in my life. Um, so then you bring in a vendor or um, in, in our case, we brought in an internal developer who does that. So I think, the best way, I don't know why this thing always happens, but um, the best thing, technology, but the, the best thing that I can say is that, um, you know, 
find those stages and it's, I don't think it's going to be the same throughout. It's not like you find a vendor and then you're just forever working with a vendor. It's like, you're probably going to start one way. Things are going to shift. This is the iteration aspect, but I think increasing our knowledge about the technology means that we can show up um, informed when we're dealing with developers. We're not just um, being led into certain directions. A lot of people hire arts informed technologists as consultants to help with that. So that's possible as well. Thank you very much. And yeah, that's almost all the time we have for the question period. So maybe if we have other thoughts from our panelists on this uh, specific question, we can uh, hear them. Do you um, have you uh, anyone else would like to uh, share their technology journey? Okay. That, that's all right. And, you know, we we do have a lot of documentation and reflection already as part of Interconnect. So uh, you, you'll probably find uh, maybe answers to questions you have or ideas and insights and reflections on more of the material. And yeah, that's almost all the time we had for this event. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And before you leave, I'd just like to say a few more words about Interconnect, uh, the Interconnect initiative, and especially about how you can learn more about it. So I mentioned at the beginning of the event that um, the uh, co-learning groups published notes on Praxis, a platform for discovering and sharing knowledge for a more collaborative and open society. Well, I invite you to take a look at the platform because you'll probably find a lot of interesting material there about digital transformation but also about a wide range of topics. We just shared a few links in the chat for you to uh, peruse and to uh, look at. As part of the Interconnect initiative, we wrote different notes on digital transformation and we'll continue to publish more in the upcoming weeks. You'll see on my slide here, uh, on my screen, a screen capture of our community on Praxis. So that is what it looks like. It is our intention that this platform can act as a knowledge base for our sector and beyond. It is a bit like Wikipedia, but for practical knowledge on all sorts of subject. It is already shared with hundreds of people, and many are using it to publish their insights in sector as diverse as urbanism or the ecological transition. So you'll definitely find notes about you know what we talked about, right? In terms of how do we reduce our uh, ecological footprint uh, in a digital project and things like that. There are definitely communities interested in that currently on Praxis. You will notice, however, that the interface of the platform is currently only available in French, but an English translation is on its way and will be progressively implemented. From our community page, like you see on the screen, you can access different notebooks or carnets, which contains our notes. For example, you can read Interconnect Web, which is a gathering of resources of all kind. We also created a notebook, Digital Initiatives in the Broad Visual and Media Arts Sector, which is a map to which you're invited to add your own project. So this is a cartography project. Actually, anyone can publish on Praxis. We hope that cultural workers and artists can use this tool to foster a more interconnected art sector. You are welcome to join the Interconnect community or to register to IMA newsletter to keep in touch with us and with our project. So this brings me to the very, the real end of this event, the very end. Uh, if you have any questions on Interconnect or about IMA in general, I'd like to direct you to, IMA, to info at IMA.ca. Since the project has ended, please allows, allows us for five business days before following up with us. I encourage, uh, again, everyone to sign up to our newsletter. This is uh, a best way, I think, to keep up with uh, IMA. You can find the link on the chat. If you'd like to continue the conversation, and I know we have a lot of questions that remained unanswered and a lot of interesting insight and conversation in the chat, I really invite you to connect with the media arts sector across the country by joining Media Arts Connect. So this is our Discord, Discord server. Uh, and the last time I checked, you could discuss with more than 300 artists and cultural workers across what we called Canada. We actually have an event coming up next week, February 29th, where we'll introduce you to TourNet, which is a bilingual web-based app that helps media artists, organization, collectives, and venues build new presentation and touring networks. 
So yeah, it's very exciting. I'm proud of our Discord and I'd love to uh, see you all join us for a conversation. So that's it for me. That's it uh, for today. That's it for us. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. My name is Benjamin J. Allard, and on behalf of IMA, I wish you all a very good end of the day.